Authenticity, I find, is the highest form of energy, and people relate to that. People want to hear someone that's like them. In this world now where attention is the biggest asset, how are you going to get it unless you make something that's worthwhile watching and listening to? The Content Capitalist Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Content Capitalist Podcast. Today I have a guest with me who is really talented at one thing, probably a few things, but the one thing we're going to focus on today is How can we deal with anxiety as CEOs, as entrepreneurs, when we've got so much going on and everybody expects everything from us all the time yesterday, there's no way to stay out of anxiety unless you have a few tactics, a few skills, and some help to deal with this at times. So I want to welcome Travis to the show. Travis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ken. Really excited to be here and a really beautiful topic to touch on, knowing that Most of my life, it's what's really held me back, especially, as I said before, took me away from a big opportunity within a professional sporting team here in Australia. And I'd love to be able to support people now with that same thing where we could have the next big thing right there, but because of their own body, it's stopping them from showing up on camera, doing public speaking, or even becoming the next big athlete, whatever it may be. So I'm really passionate about this, brother, and um, I'm happy to help out however I can. That's great. Now, Travis, I really do want to get into the actual skills and the tactics to do this. But before we do that, could you walk me through that professional sports career and your experience and why it ended? Yeah, thank you for the question, Ken. Uh, It it really came to light yesterday. I spoke at a large school here in Australia in Brisbane. Um, I think there was about 400 students, so from year 7 to 10. And that's essentially when I struggled the most with anxiety. Most people going through school, it's very hard with bullying and exams, tests, expectations, performance. And I found that that's when I really started to struggle with football as myself. So anyone that might know of Australian rugby league, it's one of the toughest sports I feel in the world. We don't wear big pads and stuff like NFL, but it came with a lot of high expectations on turning up for training. Very, very hard game to play. And my body would just freak out before trainings and games. So for me, I couldn't deal with that, Ken. And I essentially got to a point where I got offered a full-time contract as I was leaving school to go and then play with the Brisbane Broncos. And I turned it down because my overthinking, my overwhelm and everything that made me feel the way I did with anyone that does have that anxiety disorder or struggles with it, I just couldn't handle it. So rather than deal with it, I just quit altogether. Mm. And what was the reaction of like your, your schoolmates, your friends, your parents? coach like how did what was the the fallout it was tough man because i was known as the football player i was known as trav the football player from five years old i was about the size i am now which is six foot five and 140 kilos um for anyone that might be in america yeah six foot five and 320 pounds or something so i was a big boy from growing up and straight away just got thrown into football but deep down i knew i wanted to do more but society and my parents told me no, you're a football player. So deep down, I didn't know how to deal with those feelings. It was like this to and fro of, hey, I don't know if this is what I want to do, but I'm also very good at this. So I just did it. And so when I made that decision to quit, yeah, everyone was really disappointed. As you can imagine, you don't want to see someone who has so much potential throw something away that could change not only their lives, but the people around them. But I know I had to make a decision for myself to look after my own mental health, essentially. If you could do it again, would you choose differently? It's a great question because I've ruminated on this a bit. And no, because I think if I didn't make the decision at that age, I wouldn't have gone on the destructive path I did for 10 years trying to find my identity again. Because any man, any young man, especially without purpose, I've found with a lot of my clients, especially in the men's groups I run and men's work retreats, men without purpose, they just float around in the wind. And in Australia, I don't know what it's like where you guys are at, but we have a lot of really bad mental health issues with our men because they don't talk about their stuff. They don't talk about their depression, their anxiety, their struggles. So for me to experience that for the last 10 years and then grow to become the man I am today that helps And, you know, the technician, I don't think I could be as relatable as I am if I hadn't experienced it for myself. So when I talk to clients with what they're going through now, I find that they really like that I've lived what they're going through and I can support it from that sort of space as well. So you've gone into coaching and helping other men. That's what I'm gathering. And like that must have been quite a step from you not being able to make a decision to move forward as what most people would expect a man to do. 
to now leveling up to the authority where you're helping other people to get there. What triggered that transition? Yeah, I think 2020. So when 2020 happened, we all know with COVID and everything like that, I was actually walking along the beach with a good friend of mine. And he said to me, and this is where this name came from, the technician, he said, I love the way you try to rewire my mind. You're like a technician. And that to me just landed straight away. Something deep in me sort of went, wow, I love that. And I've always had a passion for helping people, Ken. I had a job where I was working in retail sales and I was selling to people, but I always, I seem to have an innate ability to listen and ask questions, deep, deep questions. And people weren't used to that. They would be telling me their deepest, darkest secrets when they're just trying to buy some shoes from me. So it sort of went to a point where at this day, this my friend said this to me, it turned very quickly into podcasting which now I've got one of the top podcasts in Australia, which then turned into coaching and running events because I think like yourself, Ken, having the ability to ask these really beautiful, intuitive questions, it can be really helpful for people to be seen, heard and loved in what they're going through. So, and that's essentially what I do now. You know, I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have is that when you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, or, you know, even a, like a podcast personality that you must have so many friends and, you know, like you'd ring up whoever and they'd have time for you because obviously you have freedom and money, but the exact opposite is true. It's so lonely and don't know who you can talk to because very few people who never had started and run a business, hired people, had to fire people, had to take on huge personal risk, like financial risk with loans. Like if you haven't done that, you will not connect with and understand the business owner. And I think that just like you said, like finding the kind of people who can connect is extremely valuable. So have you found that in your, you know, the people you help the men, are you finding that there's a lot of people who are business owners who are seeking this or how varied is your clientele? Epic question. It, it started out a bit different where it wasn't necessarily business owners and entrepreneurs. And then I started to naturally gravitate towards them because I am one myself and I find that they're some of the people that need the most help. But my mission aligns really well with people that are running businesses because the way I see my mission here, Ken, is that I can help the guys at the top who really have the ability to change the world. So they run big businesses that are doing millions of dollars and they help you know thousands of customers. If I get them running at a really healthy level and their mental health's on point, they're not struggling with anxiety, they're healthy, and they're, they've got good relationships with their family, that business benefits. And then the ripple effect is their employees benefit. And then the ripple effect beneath that is the customer's benefit. So at the top of the chain, if the technician is being part of that, I'm aligning with my biggest value, which is leaving impact on this world. So it's like, yeah, I find that the most people I help at the moment, well, now is business owners and entrepreneurs, because as you said, man, it's a, such a stressful career. It's not even a career, it's a life, it's a living, right? And I know you get this is that there is no, oh, you get your own time. You could be working all day, all night. And I think the only people that can do that is when they're doing something they love. I know I've had nights where I'm up until two in the morning editing a podcast or something, but but I know that if I don't do that, that person that needed to hear that episode doesn't hear it and it stops themselves from taking their life or not running that business that could have changed the world. So I think at the core of it, the impact that my work has on those type of people like ourselves, that's what drives me every day. And yeah, I'm finding that it's really common, man. They're getting into, they want this help. They're seeing that the holistic approach to support with shadow work, unconscious reprogramming, breath work, even meditation, journaling. They're taking these things on and understanding that that can help them not only become healthier people, but they can create more impactful businesses, which ultimately helps everyone in the world, which is beautiful, bro. Let me ask you this from a practical perspective, because, you know, what I do is we have an agency and we help entrepreneurs create content for marketing, for social media ads, you name it. And I think a lot of people who are business owners or maybe even aspiring business owners, one hurdle they face is they see that people creating content like yourself on a podcast or like me on a podcast or a lot of my clients, they have a lot of anxiety about getting in front of the camera. And they take one of two routes. A lot of people who have this anxiety, they, number one, they try to control everything. Everything is scripted, teleprompter, and they feel like they're safe if they stay within the confines of what they can control. Number two is they just kind of wing it, but then they don't have any structure or their confidence is not where it needs to be. And both of these are pretty bad ideas. Or I guess the third one is they just don't do it, right? And I think there's this level of expectation of perfection that's causing anxiety. How would you look at this from the perspective of a business owner 
and how would you help them to to handle this anxiety? Such a great question. It's, it's one of the most common things I see. And the first thing I usually do, Ken, is get them to really look within. Where is that anxiety actually coming from? Because it's a symptom of something deeper a lot of the time. It's a fear of judgment, which that fear of judgment could come from every time you tried to do something new and you failed, your dad said something awful about you or said, oh, of course you stuffed that up. And it, it can go so much deeper. But I think doing some self-healing to know where your fear is coming from, where that feeling, that belief around I'm not good enough or I have to make this perfect because if I fail, I'm not worthy. It's understanding those deep, intricate programmings that have been built through our childhood or society, our peers, who we are around, that I find is one of the biggest things that people can't overcome. Well, they can, but they don't, they choose not to. They just think that it's, oh, I just feel nervous about this. I'm not going to do this. But if they so did the, some of that deeper work. start this journey, you know, to, to, yeah. to identify and overcome these things? My, my first work would be getting with a coach, a coach or a psychologist or something that can help you understand yourself, start to understand yourself practically. One of the most practical things I can invite to anyone do is breath work. You've probably seen a lot of people now around the world can starting to breathe, you know, the Wim Hof method, things like that, where it's taking time, a moment before you even get in front of the camera to spend 10 minutes or five minutes just slow breathing. It could be box breathing. The, the Marines used to do it before they went into warfare to slow their body down, slow their mind down. Because when you're overthinking, you can't really do, can you? So breath work, meditation, becoming present. If you're present, you can't think to the future of what you can stuff up or how can this go wrong? All you're thinking about, how can I presently create content that may impact my business and the person watching. I think that's such a baseline thing to really start to get to know yourself, implement breath work, those holistic practices around meditation and journaling to understand yourself. Because I find as well, Ken, a lot of business owners tend to be very neurodivergent. It's probably a big thing you're seeing these days with ADHD, autism, things like that. And I myself am a bit on the spectrum. And I've found that if I can practically see my thoughts on paper, that can really help. So you might have in your mind this thing playing out where oh, I'm not good enough. No one wants to hear me talk about my thing. No one cares about my podcast. I find that if you challenge those thoughts and you can see them physically on paper, you can overcome them. But if they're just up in your head, they tend to make you overthink, uh, try to be a perfectionist. And like you said, not even get in front of the camera. So really challenging the thoughts can help a lot too. But there's so many different mythologies around actually understanding yourself. Because then when you show up on camera, I'm not concerned about how anyone perceives me. And I'm sure you've probably seen this a lot, Ken. Do you find a lot of people struggle with that fear of judgment and how they're perceived on camera as well? Yeah, most definitely. Especially women, women more than men. Right, so challenge that thought. Like, why do I care? about what other women think about me. And I call it a process called the five whys deep. So the, the surface level thought might be, I'm scared of showing up on camera. Okay, why? Because I used to get bullied at school. Why? And it's getting to the depths of that, that core wound that's causing the surface level symptom. So your surface level symptom is anxiety, increased heart rate, flushed face. I used to get really a red face and I'd sweat a lot before games or presentations. Your body is trying to tell you something, but also knowing that if you accept that anxiety is a normal human experience and that it's actually preparing you for something you're passionate about, it might be a different experience rather than you going, oh, why am I so anxious? I hate myself. I hate that I get so stressed. What if you think that I'm so passionate about what I do and my body's just preparing for me to create something really beautiful to create for the world. And that's why I feel this way. So it's more of an acceptance than trying to fight the natural human experience that's happening and unfolding for you right in that moment. You mentioned earlier, you have one of the top podcasts in Australia. And how long have you been podcasting for? Oh, what's it now? 30th of August. I believe it's nearly three years, two and a half years. Okay. Well, congratulations on that. Yeah. So it's, and you thank know, you, bro. This is this is called the content capitalist because I think that this, I can't count how many times I've been asked by people like, how do I actually make money with the content? What's the ROI? And podcasting is actually something that's very effective. And it has brought me a lot of listeners who became clients and it, it's got me in the door and connected with a lot of people. Could you tell me about how your podcast has affected you with what you do in the coaching area? It has been the key to everything I have today, Ken. I cannot stress enough to people how much podcasting can unlock because not only has it made me overcome my fears of public speaking or just speaking in general, I used to be so shy, I couldn't even talk to my friends. Like I could barely get words out my mouth because I stressed about how I spoke. I had almost like a speech impediment, but through talking all the time, and as you said, networking, a lot of my now friends that I have, such as people like Samantha, I only meet them because 
I get them on the podcast. I get to connect with these people I might not have had access to if I didn't have a podcast to get them onto. So I have a group program where I, I help men with their stuff. I get experts in because I've had a hundred and something guests now that I can ask, hey, would you come and do a guest call on my Zoom group program to provide your expertise? I now give value to my community because I have access to these incredible people that came on my podcast. I have become a better person because I've made mentors and friends from podcast guests who then helped me become the coach I am today. There might have been psychologists, doctors, shadow workers, breathwork facilitators, all these modalities and tools I use now as a coach. I learned and became an expert myself through getting around these people. So if people are wondering whether, yeah, like, monetize why I'm now speaking on stages in front of hundreds and potentially in thousands soon in the next few months because of a podcast. That's at the core of everything. I think what the podcast has provided is my ability to speak not only on camera, but to people to connect. And it's becoming that dot connector, probably like yourself, where you have access to so many people because of the network you've built. And as you hear that old saying is that your net worth is your network. The people you know is what's going to get you ahead. Definitely a powerful, powerful medium. And why do you think yours is as successful as it is when I think that probably 99% of podcasters will not get more than a thousand monthly downloads. And nowadays it's so flooded. You started not too long ago and you're, you said it's actually doing really well and gaining traction. Do you feel it's got to do with the subject matter? It's got to do with the shadow work you've done on yourself to present in an authentic way? What, what are your thoughts? For me personally, I believe it's my relatability. I think I don't try to be anyone else other than myself. Authenticity, I find, is the highest form of energy. And people relate to that. People want to hear someone that's like them speaking with people that they might perceive as an expert, right? Or someone in their area of genius that they don't think they could ever relate to. But because someone like myself, who speaks like most people, I'm just one of the boys, I would say. If you look at Aussie culture, it's a man that just is himself. I might swear a little bit here and there. I do on my podcast for sure. I'm very relaxed with how I show up, but then I have the ability to be, I can sort of speak at a high level as well. So I think it's the relatability factor. It's my level of, I put effort into my content. It's not just, oh, I'll just cut this up and throw it out. It's like, find that right clip that lands for the right person as well and take the time to put that passion into that. Because like you said, Ken, content is everything. In this world now where attention is the biggest asset, how are you going to get it unless you make something that's worthwhile watching and listening to. I love how much effort you put into the quality of your sound and your audio and your video and all those things because end of the day, that's also showing you as a quality human and what you do. I think a lot of people just slap something together and they don't stress too much about, oh, how's the audio quality or how does the conversation run? What are the questions like? Are they practical for the listener? It's all these little tangibles that I find make the best podcasters the best podcasters. Because one of my guests that I got on that you should get on yourself, uh, Chris Griffin, he went from 6,000 followers to like 300,000 followers in a few months because his thing is that there's a big difference, Trav, between good and great. And he started his podcast only four months ago and he's one of the top 10 podcasts in Australia now because his content quality is amazing. His guests are huge and the depth of the conversations he's having, he's getting answers from his guests that they wouldn't have said on other podcasts because he's taking the time to find out about them and ask those deeper questions. So I hope that answers that a little bit better about how I've sort of gotten to the point I am. I've found that it has fallen off a little bit lately because I stopped doing those things. You know, I was consistently in the top 50 in Australia in education. And then because the coaching and the business got so busy, the podcast fell away, the passion fell away, and my quality of conversation sort of stopped happening. So my consistency is coming back again and I'm starting to go up again. But for anyone listening, yeah, if you can really start to implement all those pieces and alchemize your podcast, you you will see a difference with the con and just showing up consistently too. I think that everybody is, you know, enamored by the rapid growth on TikTok, you know, YouTube and things like that. But for some reason, podcasts are kind of like the email of social media where, you know, it's just number one is not tied to one specific company. It's not like, you know, Meta can shut you down because it's an RSS feed, right? Just like email, you have different servers and different ways you could access the same thing. And number two, people aren't so twitchy when they're listening. And what I mean by that is when you're on your phone and you're scrolling through Instagram, then it takes three seconds and you're going to decide if you want to watch something or not and they flick off. But if you're in someone's ear while they're driving or working out, which are the two most common ways people listen to podcasts, your hands aren't free and people are more relaxed and willing to listen to a longer conversation. And whoever's listening to this right now, I'd like to know, are you driving or uh, working out? And 
if you are, then after you're done, then just let me know, <laughs> put a comment or something. But I feel like podcasting is like something that is not going to go away. I feel like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, they could potentially go away, not likely. But I don't think podcasting is going to go away in my lifetime. I just don't. So that's why for me, it's I feel it's worth it, even though it's a generally slower kind of progress. But people listen longer and uh, no one entity controls it which makes it more resilient. When you started podcasting, what was your inspiration behind that? Came from purely not wanting anyone else to go through what I went through. So I had severe depression, anxiety, all the things that we've spoken about when I was a younger man around 15 to 22. And one of my good friends, Todd Jarrett, who's an identity mentor, he talks about identity and the core purpose for a lot of people, men and women. And a lot of the time, if you want to find what your core purpose is, look at the things that hurt you. And then how do you not want other people to experience that? And for me, I don't want anyone to go through the stuff I went through, Ken. I don't want people to worry about what is their purpose? What is their mission? What is their point of living? So by me getting experts in their fields or just not everyday people, even some of the best episodes I've had well, that no one know about, they've maybe got 200 followers on Instagram. They're just a dad from the local area, but they are so related relatable in their what they've gone through that people go wow it feels so nice to hear a conversation around a dad of three kids struggling with what he's struggling with like the cost of living and how he gets through it and the mindset he has and the relatability factor in that alone they're some of the most shared episodes i get you know and that's what i love i'm here to tell stories i'm here to show people that no one may have never heard about before because they don't have followers on instagram but they have an incredible story and incredible knowledge that hasn't been heard before so if i can be the dot connector for those people that's why i started doing what i was doing i realized that my level of expertise is my ability to network with people I can meet people and connect people so easily. So if I can do that for people that may have never heard of, one of my greatest episodes ever was a guy that is a local kinesiologist from our local area on the Sunshine Coast here in Queensland. But his knowledge around David Hawkins' theory around letting go and how he spoke into love and the frequencies and evolution of humans, people were blown away by it. I think it got shared over 50 times, which is crazy for a podcast, social media to be tagged in that many stories. And I think that's where it really starts to change is that humans love to be accepted. So if they see something that everyone else is doing, they're going to get amongst it. They want to be a part of this change that's happening. And they're like, oh, if 10 of my friends just shared that episode, it must be good. So then it starts to grow and grow. And that's why I do what I do. So if I see that impact and my core story of rewiring mind, body and soul through these epic stories and tools, tips and tactics from the technician, man, that's exactly why I do the podcast. And I guess why it does so well. Thanks for sharing that. The growth of a podcast really just has to do with the quality of content. And that's something that, you know, you can't fake or really growth hack so much compared to like what people do on Instagram and stuff. I'm interested in one thing, which is as I have clients and most of the listeners here are going to be business owners or aspiring business owners. And we're talking about content creation and how to actually use that in your business. Could you share a bit of how your podcast links to your business and how do they interact with each other? Yeah, I love this question. And it popped up before that I find that, as you said, if people are driving in their car or at working out, whatever it may be, um, especially as business owners are quite busy all the time, they're doing their thing, but a lot of them do like to work out as well. They're high level humans. I find that what happens is that they get to know me through the podcast. So when it comes time to reaching out about coaching, they're already in, Ken. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I had to do a sales call. I'm just, it's in the DMs. Hey, Trav, I've been listening to this episode with such and such. I'm listening to this episode. It's speaking to my soul. I I need to work with you. And that is such a tangible action point around having a podcast, especially for coaches, content creators, marketing agencies, whatever it is, because people back people, they want to trust people. Too many times have we been let down by people that give us the world or trust and say, I'm going to make you this much, this money, if you pay me this, this, and this. And it's like, well, I don't trust you. As a human, I want to trust you and know you. So if they get to know you on a deeper level through a podcast where you're just sharing who you are, then I think that's a lot of the groundwork already done for any business owner. And it doesn't matter what business you're doing. You could you could be selling like FBA through Amazon, some sort of electric toilet that flushes itself. But if they know you as the business owner and not just the electric toilet company, they know you as Tony Smith who went through, um, he was an orphan that created his own million dollar business because he just wanted to create change in the world through something he wanted to shift. Well, I'm going to back that dude over the other business that has no personality to it. That's the one thing I would say. And you hear it all the time from people like Gary Vee, people back people like personal brand is becoming so big now. If they can resonate with your story, who you are, what you've come through, this, the hardships you've overcome, how much you care, the passion, they are going to resonate with you as a human. 
there's just no if, ands or buts about it, Ken. Like I noticed that people will back me over anyone else that's doing this in the game because I, I care and they know I care because of the way I speak, the way I create my content. I might be really passionate one day and rather than me creating a really deep, in-depth, captioned reel that speaks directly to my ideal client, I just want to rant for eight minutes about how much I hate seeing people get taken advantage of, you know, or how excited I am that the little boy that could never even speak to his parents because he was so shy is now speaking on stage in front of 400 kids. Like that is what people want to see. And it blows my mind that this day and age, people aren't sharing more. They aren't showing who they are. And I guarantee you that more business owners will have more success if they start to show themselves and show up in an authentic way and just be them rather than this other. Do you allow swearing on here at all, Ken? <laughs> I've got the E rated thing on it. Yeah. Beautiful. I'm sick of the bullshit, bro. I want to see the real shit. I'm sick of seeing the surface level stuff. Like, let's be real. Let's be authentic. My whole line is let's fucking be raw to the core. Let's actually show who we are rather than just faking it because once you actually connect with those humans, those customers, those clients as humans and not as numbers, every follower I get, I do my best to send a video message to them to say, thank you. Thank you for taking the time and effort to come and back someone you don't know because of what I'm trying to do. Because every single little digit I see pop up on my Instagram, I know that's a human behind that most of the time. Hopefully it's not a bot or something, right? But if it's a human that has taken their time and effort to come and follow me and watch me, I'm going to give them my time and effort for as long as I can. Now, you know how you said that, you know, we're so afraid of being ourselves, our raw selves, being raw to the core, or like, that's what we need to do. I think that raises anxiety amongst business owners to do that because they're representing not just themselves, but all their employees, their business. And if let's say they have a political or religious view, no matter what your stance is, half of your audience is not going to like it. And maybe a quarter of them are going to leave in terms of like even clients and business. So how do you navigate that in terms of like getting over that level of anxiety or What's the insight that we should be filtering this through? That's a great question. For me personally, knowing the day and age and the modern world and what things get taken out of context, I probably keep some of those things to myself, right? Like it's any of those opinions about that sort of stuff. I sort of, I will give my opinion on it if I'm asked about it, right? But if it's in regards to knowing that it may affect people outside of me, I don't want to hurt people outside of me based off my actions as well. Yeah, I think, and that's such a great question because Yes, you can be raw and real and all the things, but if your actions are going to be a detriment to the people around you that you're responsible for, especially like I've got a business where I do have people, I have people around me, business partners, things like that. I can't just go out there and do what I want if it's going to hurt them as well. But can I be myself in my own brand? Can I speak my truth around my own story and what's happening for me, but also be kind and caring enough not to rub too many people the wrong way as well? I think it's a fine line there. So yeah, it's actually, it's actually, it's actually a tough question to answer in this day and age, knowing how politically correct they expect us to be, right? With so many different things now. So I think it's like being authentic to a point and understanding that we live in a human world with consequences as well. So you don't want to do anything stupid either. But I think to get rid of that anxiety is just be prepared. I'm sure you, every time you do a podcast or anything like that, you've got some sort of framework to work around so that you feel confident that no matter what, when you show up, you know, you've got your framework to work with. You know, the scaffolding is set for you to build the home. So as long as the scaffolding's there, pretty safely going to be able to build that home correctly. Yeah. I do have a framework. I use it more as a backup in case the conversation gets lost. Somebody who's quite famous in Australia, Jim Penham, Jim's Lawns, that guy, he, he was on the show. And one thing that he shared though, was that the more controversial he got on social media, the more his business boomed. Like he was speaking very vocally against the government actions during COVID lockdown. He has very strong opinions about politics. I don't know if he touches on religion, but I think that what he's done is he's gone into it knowing that he's taking the side of his audience and his potential customers. And therefore it's safe to be controversial siding with the people who he's championing. And so that was, I think that was strategic, whether or not he really planned it strategically, I'm not sure. But I think that you pick the battles that build your brand and actually further your message. Avoid the battles that it doesn't make any sense then that is actually not related to how you help people at all. And I think that that's kind of the rule of thumb that I've been going with. Like if, if it's going to support what I believe and my business, by all means, whether it's controversial or not, I'm going to jump in and eat that cake, you know, but it's got to be both if it's for the business, but against my personal brand, of course not, you know, or against my personal morals and vice versa, even if it's something I believe, but it's going to hurt my business. I don't need to announce it. It's just that's personal, right? I'm very much the same, bro. I like that. I think what really makes, especially as you just said there, I think you do need to stand up for what you believe in, especially as a man. Like in Australia, if we can 
have our values and beliefs to, to stand by, people respect that. Like they want the champions, they want the heroes to stand up for the people, right? So yeah, I agree. When it's really something that I'm passionate about and I want to speak into, I will, especially we've had some stuff happen here recently with racism around our indigenous people. I will stand up for those sort of things because I can't stand that. I hate bullying, especially for anything in regards to that. So as you said, when it's something strong and I feel so passionate about that, even if it's gonna hurt in some way some people don't see it i am still gonna speak up for it i agree so thank you for touching on it the way you did i've got a question now this podcast is my show not your show and not necessarily all your listeners are going to hear this but is there something you've ever wanted to say and then you decided not to because whatever reason but you'd feel safe saying it here like an opinion you had about something that happened or a belief you hold oh i like this yeah i don't like how opinionated or combative the professional system is in regards to mental health so therapists psychologists uh, psychotherapists they talk a lot of shit about coaches bro a lot of these people because that feel threatened might not they have or oh, I don't have a bit of paper to say I can do this, this, and this. No, I can still help people really, really well because a lot of the time I've lived the fucking experience my clients have. I come from a place of I know where that person has been through, where they've been laying in bed and they can't get up for work because they would rather kill themselves than go to that job they fucking hate, right? Whereas a psychologist is sitting there reading from a textbook that they learned for seven years in university, but they have no compassion or heart towards this human. They're just another client that walked in the room that they get paid $200 for for the hour and they want to ask them questions and then they ask them the same fucking questions for the next two years. I want to help my clients come to me, give them the help and the tools and the resources so they can be self-empowered so they don't need me anymore. I find that a lot of the time, and not everyone, I'm not speaking about all professionals in this regard. I love the mental health services. I've used psychologists before. But what I see a lot of, Ken, is that it's all about keeping the people in the system. How can we keep them sick and unhealthy so that we keep their money? How can we give them more drugs or Valium to just dote them out rather than give them, get out in nature, get into some sun, eat some healthy food, read some cool books, do some breath work and you might fucking feel better. No, let's keep you in the darkness, in your corporate job you hate, away from your friends and connection with people, away from nature where you get to, as a natural human being, you're designed to be out in earth, you know? So that's something I'm super passionate about, man. I'm sick of it. And I, I cop a lot of shit from those type of people saying, oh, you didn't go to university and do this, this and this. No, I didn't. Because I also think some of that's a lot of bullshit. I'm grateful for our doctors and our neurosurgeons and people that have taken the time to go and do that and become those people that save lives. I agree. But there's also some roles where I don't believe you need to go and do that. I could go learn the same thing in six weeks from YouTube because education has changed. It's not the same old go to a building for six years. It's how quickly can I learn this? How efficiently can I learn this in my own way? And I just learn differently. It's like we still are making monkeys try to swim in water and turtles try to climb trees. It's the same old schooling system. They're trying to make them do shit they're not good at and it's not working and it's changing and they see that. So yeah, man, that'd be something I'd love to say here. You should. You should share that on your channel. You should say something like, you know what? If I was walking past a house and I noticed it's on fire and there's a kid in the window, I'm not a licensed fireman. So what do I do? So I wait till they show up or should I run in there and grab the kid before the house burns down on him? Like, would, would you get upset because I don't have a red cap and uh, a hose in my hand and wearing a fireman's jacket and didn't get a license for it. It's like, probably not. And it's kind of the same thing. Like maybe you could do a different version of it and you could help with your training. And I, I believe you can. However, they came to me and I'm going to do what I can to help them because I resonate with them. And I think that there is a lot of respect for people who do go through that training. I have respect for them, but I also think that just like in sports, and just like in any kind of high level professionalism, people are going to connect with certain people better and therefore learn and progress faster when there is that bond. Just like oh, you know, public school, certain teachers, you know, brilliant. You're, you're at the edge of your seat. You're excited to see them. Other ones, you fall asleep before they could even pick up the chalk, right? Because it's not about the subject. It's about the person. And that's what I think they feel threatened about because if they're honestly a boring person who doesn't care, they could have the capacity and the capability, but not the same effectiveness because it's not them. My wife tells me something totally different than if a stranger on the street tells me the exact same thing. I would feel a completely different energy because it's that person. And it's not just a title, you know, put a DR in front of their name. You know, that's sure.
great. You're a doctor. You're good at what you do, but this person wants to work with me or for whatever reason. So I think that that has to be respected just as much that you won their trust and they didn't. Man, thank you for saying that because what you've just reminded me is that yesterday after that talk to those kids, the principal of the entire school, and I mean, this is a big school, man, like 2,000, 3,000 kids, right? She was blown away by how many questions the kids were asking after the speech. They don't talk like that. They don't ask those questions and it made them realize that something's changing. The kids need relatability. I dress like just one of the kids, right? I wear Jordans. I wear Nike hats. I wear clothes that they might perceive as cool, right? Because that's just how I like to dress. And I speak like them. I get their humor. I was a kid. So I'm still a big kid, even though I'm 34 years old. There is that 12, 13, 14, 15 year old in me that still loves to have fun and laugh and just have a giggle. And if you looked at that room yesterday, I could tell they were just so in it. They were so just, and they did all the interactive actions I got them to do. And a teacher came up to me after and said, thank you so much. I just watched all my middle school boys who love people like Andrew Tate and all that sort of thing. I think they just realized what a real man is and what real health is and what real confidence is and how to actually be a happy, healthy, supportive human. And that was beautiful. That was really cool to hear that young boys who might be in grade seven to 10 are seeing what kind of male role model they could look at and become. And man, this was cool. In my stories, I put up a picture where a couple of the boys came down afterwards and wanted my signature. It's like they saw me as like a, an athlete, right? It was cool. And then I got back to my car with my fiance and I thought I had a ticket on my car. It was underneath the, the wipers. I thought, no, surely I haven't got a ticket just parking in the school. It was a letter from one of the kids. They'd written on there, thank you so much for your speech today. It's helped so much. Like that in itself makes this everything I do worth it. If that's one kid that has been changed, knowing I, I definitely hit so many kids there if that one kid has walked away and took the effort to write a letter to me for that that's when i know i'm doing the right thing and not caring about if i get questioned if i have a bit of paper to say if i can do these things right amazing that's yeah it makes it worth it all like no amount of money can buy that it's got to be and no degree can buy that either it's real authentic connection period we've got to wrap this up and travis what i want to ask you to do is think of a question that my listeners can ask themselves that's going to unlock something for them to get out of anxiety and into authenticity, into get out of presenting and into projecting, right? Get out of teaching and into connecting. Like what's that question where if they internalize, it might unlock something for them. I'm going to share something that has changed my life in the last six months and made me go harder than ever. I had so much passion when I started this, Ken, and I think I lost it. I got caught up in things. But a friend of mine, another coach, she asked me a question. I told her about an opportunity I had. It was to go and speak at a professional sporting team, that same team that I quit at 17. And I let it go by because I, I deep down unconsciously was afraid of the opportunity. I was scared to go talk to these guys that I looked up to. She said to me, how dare you? How dare you let your own shit get in the way of you showing up for those men that you could have changed their lives? What if you had gone and given that presentation and one of those men needed to hear it and it changed his whole family's life? It changed his kids' lives. How dare you let your own stuff get in the way of just doing the thing that you know you're here on this earth to do? So I ask the question to anyone listening right now, what things in your own life are you letting get in the way of helping that person that needs you? And I don't care what it is, whether you're a coach, a business owner, a public speaker, you own a massive corporation that provides products. What if that product changes someone's life in some way? What is your man on the moon mission? Like how can you make something that you do mean so much more than you think it does? And then use that fire to overcome the bullshit that you let hold you back from helping the people that need you. That's what I would say. Could you phrase that again in one succinct question? Because I want someone to take this and listen to it on repeat. I want you to think about the things that you're letting stop you do the things you're here to do. How dare you not show up and be the person that those people need. This content could change their life. So please do the thing. Take action. Beautiful. Thank you. And I am I'm taking that internally myself too. There are a few things, if I'm honest. So let's wrap this up. Travis, I am going to put your link down below. If anyone's watching on YouTube, check out the link in the description. If you're on the podcast listening with audio, go to the show notes and you'll find Travis's information, his podcast, and how you can get in touch with him. And uh, Travis, thanks so much for spending your time with us. And for everybody else, I'll see you next week. No hustle, worship here, we're a different breed. Action is what we got if action is what you need. Content capitalists, we're breaking the mold. Cause the old ways fade, new stories to be told. So content capitalists, get to the prize.